Well, hello, my friends. And before we get into today's exciting episode, some exciting news to share with you. Today is going to be, contrary to the headlines and everything else, blowing our direction. Get ready for it. Today is going to be an awesome day. I have the great fortune of bringing you along the journey with me. I'm heading today into the studio to record the audio version of my new book. It's called In Awe. I have absolutely loved having you in the front seat with me as we've researched and written out this book. You may not know, but it's true that Andre Norman from the podcast, Ben and Amy Wright from the podcast, Rada Agrawal from the podcast, Mick Ebling, among many, many, many other leaders that we've had the pleasure of bringing on our show, interviewing, learning from, and growing with, are part of the book in awe. Well, today, you get a front seat again. Buckle up and get ready to see behind the scenes the audiobook recording and a short reading from yours truly. That's right, John O'Leary. In all, the book is packed with inspirational stories that will remind you that your days aren't just something to endure, but a marvelous gift to savor. I know the coronavirus outbreak has us all maybe even a little bit more than a little anxious right now. And yet I look forward to reigniting your hope for tomorrow and reminding you of the truth that in spite of the headlines and in spite of the fear and in spite of some of the panic going on, the best is yet to come. It's true. You are invited now to a behind the scenes look with me at publication day as we move toward May 5th. I want you right now to join me at www.readinawe.com. It's there that you can pre-order a copy of the book. It's there that you can get some additional free in awe goodies. You can hear about the early buzz. You can see some of the new videos that are coming out behind the scenes. All that's going to be available for you right now when you go check out the website, www. Come on, I'll wait for you. Here it goes one more time. www.readinawe.com. I'll see you there. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Have an amazing guest joining us today to talk about a really important topic, in particular during the current climate that you and I are working, raising families, living our lives, leading our professional journeys in. His name is Sean Aker. Sean is the New York Times bestselling author of The Happiness Advantage and Big Potential. Sean spent 12 years at Harvard, where he won over a dozen distinguished teaching awards and has delivered lectures on positive psychology in the most popular class in all of Harvard. Sean has since become one of the world's leading experts on the connection between happiness and success. Sean has worked with over a third, that's amazing, of the Fortune 100 companies with names like NASA, and the NFL, and the Pentagon, and the U.S. Treasury in addition to it. To do his work, Sean has traveled to more than 50 countries, speaking to farmers in Zimbabwe, to CEOs in China, doctors in Dubai, school children in South Africa. Oprah Winfrey did two episodes of Super Sunday with Sean on the science and on the happiness of meaning. His research on happiness has made the cover of the Harvard Business Review. His TED Talk is one of the most popular of all time with almost 20 million views. And his lecture airing on PBS has been seen by tens of millions of individuals. My friends, with the coronavirus capturing every single headline and seemingly certain doom creeping toward all of us, I wanted to bring on a guy that I respect an expert that I look up to as a beacon of light to not only weather this current storm, but to sail forward with greater optimism, greater hope, and greater happiness. So my friends, today I want you all to buckle up, 
But rather than looking at the headlines, look up at the sun rising, look up at the possibility as we bring on a guy that I look up to and a man that I think you will as well. His name is Sean Aker. Sean, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much for having me. Well, man, as, as you've just heard, I uh, I might be your biggest fan. So I'm kind of fa- <laughs> fanboying out right now. But uh, what the audience who just heard that introduction may not know about you is you weren't raised in the hallowed halls of Harvard. You grew up in a little bit of a smaller town in the southern part of our country down in Waco, Texas. So I, I was hoping to begin this interview, not with what you're doing today, but with what your life was like growing up. So talk about Waco, Texas. Talk about your childhood. <laughs> well, I grew up in uh, Waco of the 80s and 90s. Um, so this is before Chip and Joanna Gaines got there and, <laughs> and fixed it up. And uh, I loved it. Um, I have to say that uh, it was a great place to, to grow up. My father was a professor at Baylor. He studied neuroscience. And my uh, mom was a high school English teacher, so both educators. And I grew up, um, you know, getting to see you know, uh, not only a small town, but also Waco going through all the challenges it went through um, Mm. uh, as well. So I, it kind of, it started me on a path where I was really interested in religion and faith or how someone's beliefs about the world changed their actions. So, um, and had all the influence of educators and a psychologist in the family or a neuroscientist. So um, it led directly to what I'm doing today. Sean, some of our listeners may have no clue what you're talking about when you say the challenges that Waco endured in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they, they view Waco as an awesome town to go to get your house redecorated by two That's amazing right. artists. So j- just give us a snippet into what you're referring to. There is a, uh, um, for I don't know the correct term for it, but a cult that um, of some people that lived outside of Waco um, and uh, they got in, you know, to conflict with the government uh, between faith and and you know uh, collecting weapons and uh, some other things they were doing that weren't great, um, to to say the least. And so the government stepped in and um, they fired back at the government. Um, and um, some ATF soldiers uh, or uh, ATF uh, uh, officers were injured and and killed. And we could see. Um, uh, when the, it finally went down, um, when the raid actually finally occurred after a standoff right. with the cold, um, we could see, uh, the fire and the smoke from my high school off in the distance, um, as you know, the, the cult and the government were fighting with one another. And it was fascinating to watch. I have to say, I, I've never been asked this on a podcast, but you know, it was really interesting to see, um, uh, how people's beliefs came in conflict with, other people's beliefs, right? That yeah. here are some people that are living one way and I don't think a great way, but they um, then got in conflict with the government. So I think, you know, I got to see, you know, religion and government clash in my backyard growing up. Um, and it's, you know, given me an insight into and some compassion for um, how you see people having conflicts now, either with the government or trying to figure out um, where their truth is and what they're trying to do with their lives. You have a compassionate, joy-filled heart. Was that something that you've been fostering or was it something you just innately had as a little one? And even as you're looking out the window, watching the smoke rise in the distance you had even back then? Um, I would love to say that I feel like I'm, I grew up with compassionate parents. Um, in fact, to the point where if, uh, if I have a fault, it's where I get walked on because of the compassion. Um, uh, but I, that's, that's, um, I, I think that comes naturally to me, um, but understanding didn't come naturally to me. I thought I was really understanding and compassionate, but um, growing up in Waco, I had sort of only seen one version of the world. Mm. Um, so when I got to go up to Harvard, when I was up in Boston, um, I suddenly, you know, my worldview exploded outward, outward. You know, I went to the divinity school actually after graduating from undergrad and, and you know, they had every religion from the Amish to, you know, Zoroastrianism, they say from A to Z there at the, uh, oh. so like this is billions of people view the world differently than billions of other people. And um, I find it fascinating from a faith perspective, but I also find it fascinating from a psychological perspective is you see an event occur within the world, like something that happens in news or something that happens in a school. 
and you see how many different versions of how people try to deal with that situation actually are. And you see some people like yourself who take a challenge and then rise out of that and use that challenge as something that propels them forward and helps other people. And then you find other people that when they go through a challenge, it paralyzes them and they feel like, or that causes them to become bitter. So I'm fascinated by what causes that difference between a grateful, energized, activated life versus one that feels fearful or small or paralyzed. Well, I think you and I share several commonalities. And one of them, and I hope you're sitting down, audience, one of them is that both Sean Aker and John O'Leary applied to Harvard University. That's right. I did my application as a joke to prove to my friends I could get a rejection letter for Harvard, and I got one. Sean, you did it on a dare. Talk talk about that dare and why you went forward with it. Um, I yeah, I I didn't think I was going to get into Harvard. I wasn't valedictorian. I didn't get perfect SAT scores. I was a volunteer firefighter actually back in Waco. Um, so being a firefighter, um, given what happened with the Branch Davidian compound and the fire that happened there, um, that was part of my essay. Yeah. Um, and so we got an acceptance letter. And to be honest, you know, this is also something we, uh, I'm so glad you're asking these questions because um, I never get to talk about this, but I, I just remember that when I received the acceptance letter, we were sh- so shocked as a family. Like I remember being excited. And then my mom said, Hey, don't tell anyone at school because I don't think this is real. <laughs> like she, for a week, I didn't tell anyone. It actually came out. Um, it came out. It's good like, to humble parts. your kids. I think it's why she <laughs> she kept a high, a low ceiling on you. Yes, it was just because it was so stunning. Um, my parents are very humble people, and like I didn't expect it. So they were just like, in case this is a mistake, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, and then we couldn't afford it. And then I got a military scholarship um, three weeks later through the Navy, um, which suddenly made this this thing that wasn't even a possibility become a reality. You know, Sean, I've heard you several times credit this essay as to probably why you got into Harvard. This idea of bridging what happened on that ranch with your experience as a volunteer firefighter. Would you just share with me the essence of what that what that essay was that you wrote that got you into Harvard? Um, you know, I I would love to go back and read it. I, I need to. Um, but it was, um, it, I think it was talking about how um, I, um, one, grew up in this place where no one expected to go to Harvard. No one from my school had. Um, I didn't know anyone who had. The only people I'd only thing I knew about Harvard was from uh, uh, from the movies, and you know, I I'd never traveled outside the country before, so I had a very small uh, worldview in life. Um, but I was hungry to learn so much more. So I think part of that got across in the essay. Um, I think part of um, hopefully, uh, you know, the other thing I, I really focused on was talking about how um, that I would be happy and content. Mm. Um, anywhere, like if I got in or not. Um, but if I got in, I want to be there for the other people that I would make sure that they had an amazing time there as well. And I'd see it as such a privilege that um, I'd try and help other people see what a privilege it was as well. And um, I don't know what got me in, um, but I do know uh, I had a friend later on whose mom was on the admissions committee and she remembered me as the f- firefighter from Waco. Mm. So um, I know that had an influence somehow. Well, you walk onto campus your first day. It is in Boston. It is in Mass. It is an amazing university campus. You grab your breakfast and you look up and it's, you know, stained glass windows, chandeliers, incredible wood beams. You're grateful. And then yet as you go around your experience freshman year, you recognize that many of the, your peers aren't as appreciative of their experience, of their opportunities. Why do you think that was? Um, that that was a shock. Um, I felt so grateful to be there. It was uh, stunning. I just assumed everyone else would be so happy to be there as well. Um, but what I started noticing was there were a lot of students that just kind of expected to be there. So their expectations were matched, and they actually didn't feel the type of happiness I felt when something came above my expectations. Um, but in addition to that, I, very quickly, our brains started focusing not just on the privilege of being there, your brain forgets about that and it starts then refocusing on the workload, the stresses, the hassles, the complaints, the frustrations, um, and what's going to happen to me four years from now. Mm. So very quickly they shift from, this is amazing, I got into the school I really wanted to go to, to what am I going to do next? 
um, then then I'll feel happy once I, you know, have an investment banking job or get into this graduate school, or one, I'll be happy once I leave here and have a job. Whatever it is that they were looking forward to, they started looking forward instead of where they were. Sounds a lot like not only what Harvard students do, but for all graduates of uh, of life. I think many of us have that same uh, weakness of rather than embracing the gift and the miracle of the moment, we look forward. We look forward. So you, you've said in some of your research that 80% of Harvard students report being depressed over the previous four years, which is stunning. And even more painful is to hear this, that 10% have considered suicide in the past 12 months. Um, yeah, it's it's it was stunning. Um, and now that I've traveled to do this in more than 50 countries, we realized it wasn't just these privileged Ivy League students who were experiencing this. It's exactly what you were just describing. It was how the brain views the world. Um, I think one of the very first uh, aha moments I had, but that shifted my entire thinking around happiness, um, was when I started doing the psychological research on those Harvard students and realized that, um, that the success wasn't yielding the happiness that we expected because every time your brain has a success, your brain is designed to change the goalpost of what success looks like. It's designed to do that, right? So whatever you thought was the goal that's going to make you super happy in life, as soon as you get there, your brain's designed to change it very quickly. Um, it's why we don't stop, you know, if you put Legos together as a four-year-old, you don't think, well, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm successful in life and that's it, right? Um, as soon as you put those Legos together, you want to try something else and you want to mm-hmm. see what your brain's capable of. That's actually highly adaptive. We want to see what the brain's capable of. We want to keep pushing. We don't want to become complacent. Um, actually, so all of that's good. The only problem is where happiness fits in it, right? Because we keep thinking to ourselves, if I work harder and achieve this goal and or achieve this position in my life or this good thing happens, then I'll feel happier. And that scientifically and empirically doesn't happen. Um, because one, because the goalpost changes very quickly for that for the brain, but also we found that if your success rates actually do rise for the next five-year period of time, mm-hmm. your happiness levels basically statistically flatline. They don't move very much. So what we started to, to think is that happiness and success were actually separate from one another. Um, but then we realized that if you just switch around the research, um, if you find some way of, instead of watching somebody who becomes more successful and then testing their happiness, if you switch around and you find a way of getting somebody to become happier, you raise their gratitude for the present. You deepen their social networks. You raise their levels of optimism. If one of those things occur, what we saw was all of their success rates started to rise mm-hmm. dramatically. Their business outcome, educational outcome. So we got so excited that maybe we had the formula backwards. Well, this, this idea of optimism, gratitude, and social connectivity. Three buzzwords you just used. Right now, with this wave of the coronavirus sweeping not only the United States, but the entire world, I think all three of those are at great risk of fading into darkness. So take this idea of happiness from the research projects at at Harvard into how we can apply them in real life as we read headlines, as we see stock markets dip, as we see schools close their doors and businesses shut up for a season – how do we remain happy and focused on the things we can control when it feels like there's nothing we can control? It's a really big question, but I think it's actually one of the most important questions we could ask. Because I feel like happiness in good times is actually more of a luxury item. Um, when things get difficult, when challenge rises, happiness actually has an even more beneficial effect upon the outcomes for that person. Um, so In the darkest times is when we actually need optimism, gratitude, and social connection the most. So when I I started doing this research, I was starting with the Harvard students, but I realized very quickly that this is amazing that we can raise someone's levels of happiness. Um, So I wanted to share it with other people. So I started doing it with companies and went uh, to one or two companies. And then uh, um, that was in 2008. Then the global economy collapsed. So I actually got started doing this happiness research in the midst of a time where the banks were failing, we had no idea if the entire currency system was going to be able to continue. Mm-hmm. We had no idea when it was going to recover. And I started working with actually the banks who had lost the ability to pay their people, but still wanted to move forward so that they could keep everything afloat. 
Um, so what we got to do is to battle test this research to see if if you can raise someone's levels of happiness when times are challenging. So, you know, with coronavirus, with people having to shutter their business, with, you know, I, I've had my next um, seven talks actually canceled. Um, so, you know, going out and speaking like that, uh, you know, all of that disappears very quickly, right? So um, what we're finding is in the midst of all of those changes, um, I think it's and crucial to understand what we're talking about in terms of happiness. Um, what we're not talking about is irrational optimism. Um, so I, I, I gave a, um, I talked to, I gave a talk one time to a group of, uh, of CEOs of software companies. And afterwards, one of the CEOs offered to drive me to the airport <laughs> to talk about the research. Uh, and I was so excited to talk to this guy because I thought maybe we could test some things out at this company. And I got into his really fancy car and we, he immediately started to go and he started zooming up and down the streets. He was going so fast and weaving in and out of cars and I was holding on for dear life. And when, when he started the car and we first started driving, that little seatbelt bell was going off and eventually it stopped going off. And I looked at him and I was trying to like get him to slow down a little bit or get his brain focused on it because he was talking so fast. And I was like, um, I'm, I'm sorry, you don't wear seatbelts? He said, no, Sean, I listened to your talk. I love your research. I'm an optimist too. And kept driving. <laughs> and so um, and I was like, no, you're crazy. That doesn't, that, that doesn't right. count as optimism, right? And the reason I'm telling that story is that, that um, optimism is great for a lot of things. It doesn't stop reality from impinging upon you. It doesn't stop a car from hitting you. What optimism does is allows your brain to be the most adaptive possible when the negative does occur, which I, I think, you know, encapsulates part of your own story, um, your own history grow, uh, growing up. And, um, but also, I, I think it gives a, us a path forward because what we don't want is people to be irrationally optimistic, which means right. if you sugarcoat the present, you make terrible decisions for the future. You don't solve the problems you need to. Um, well, and, and people stop believing in your leadership advice because they think you're divorced from reality. Um, and you can see that on social media. You can see people going between uh, two different responses to all the negative that's going on. You can see everything's going to be fine. We don't even talk about it type of idea, um, which is turning more of a blind eye to some of the problems. But then the, the people on the other side are like, you're not seeing anything. That's and right. they think that you're divorced from reality. The other side is you see a problem and you assume it's permanent and pervasive, that it affects everything automatically, that there's no other good parts, and that it's permanent. It'll probably exist for, for at least a very long time. Um, and what happens when that occurs is the brain gets paralyzed. So on the one hand, you have people that aren't solving the problems because they're turning a blind eye to it. The other side isn't solving the problems because they feel like that there's nothing you can do, right? The middle path is what I study, which is rational optimism, which starts I love it. with with a realistic assessment of the present, but maintains the belief that eventually my behavior will matter if linked to the right people. And I, I love this because I think that that allows us the middle path of being right. able to see problems, but not get paralyzed by them as long as we believe our behavior will eventually matter if linked to the right people. So Sean, I, I hear your voice. I've heard many of your talks, read your books, love it. You're married, you got two healthy kids, you're, you're living the high life. And I think as a listener right now, they might be at risk of thinking, well, of course this guy's happy. He's got his life laid out. He's got best-selling books. He's probably got more money than anybody else I know. Of course he's happy. And yet you yourself have admitted bravely, I think, that you've dealt with bouts of depression while teaching happiness. That's right. Um, actually, while I was at Harvard, um, you know, in this incredible environment, I graduated and I realized if I left, they might, they might not let me back in. So I just stayed. <laughs> and when I graduated that summer, I moved from the senior dorms down to the freshman dorms and lived there for the next eight years. Um, they invited me to. That sounds <laughs> I wasn't that guy. awfully suspicious. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, in exchange for room and board, which is what I needed to live there, um, they give you 30 freshmen a year. You live in the dorms with them. You live in the trenches there with them. You eat all your meals with them and you counsel them during that first year of being in a hyper-competitive environment because they know that the students are coming from all over the world with different backgrounds being thrust together and they've all been these bright lights in their own community and now, you know, 50% of them are below average, right, mm -hmm. um, in that environment. So uh, uh, there's a lot of shattering that occurs. So they put these, um, these graduate students in the dorms to be their friends and to be there and counsel them. 
So my job was to make sure that they didn't go through depression. And while I did this, I went through two years of depression myself. Um, it, there's a lot of reasons why it happened. Um, one of them was, you know, coming from Waco, I had had one vision of the world. And so I went to divinity school and realized that there were so many other versions of the world. Um, it broke down my, um, my beliefs about the world and I had to rebuild them back up. So for a while I didn't have beliefs about the world, which was extraordinarily disorienting, yeah. but also I was very lonely, right? I was in a hyper competitive environment. I'm more, um, uh, introverted. So I wasn't sure how really to make friends. I didn't really reach out. And as a result of that, my social connection went, um, a lot of my, um, faith at the time went, um, and, um, I started going th- and I started feeling down and had no idea what was going on. And then um, as I kept going deeper and deeper in it, I was studying you know, positive psychology. I was studying uh, faith and religion. And I was there to help counsel these students. And the more I learned about it, the more I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually depressed. I have no yeah. idea how this happened because I'm in this an amazing environment. I grew up with great parents. Um, I've always been an optimist. What is going on? And so I thought I could figure it fix it myself. I thought I could, you know, I was good at checking off individual metrics in my life. So I thought, you know, I'll I'll read a self-help book about it and I'll solve this myself. And, uh, and I kept going deeper and deeper in depression. And I remember I, you know, I just stopped caring about everything, um, in my life and including caring about whether or not I wanted to get better. Um, so at the bottom, I had to turn to my eight closest friends and family and I was like, I, I really need your help. I've been going through depression for more than two years. I don't think I'm ever getting out of this, but I really need your help. And the groundswell of support was amazing. People were calling me, meeting up with me, emailing me, bringing me cupcakes. But as soon as I did, something really important changed. So I wrote a book that came out two years ago. And in that book, I shifted from studying what was um, an individual approach to happiness, which is change your individual habits, then your happiness will rise, then Mm -hmm. your success will rise to this idea of realizing that the majority of our happiness and success is interconnected with one another. Um, So I I start the the book with this study where um, these two researchers out in Virginia found that if you're looking at a hill, you need to climb in front of you. If you look at that hill by yourself, your brain actually shows you a hill that is 20% steeper than a hill of the same height you perceive while standing next to someone who's going to climb it with you. So the inclusion of somebody else looking at that hill with you changes your brain's perspective on that hill by 20%. And now we know it's more for the emotional ones, overcoming depression and anxiety, trying to get out of financial debt, trying to graduate from school, trying to figure out what to do in the midst of challenges from the coronavirus or challenges that are occurring because of uh, the economy sputtering or challenges that we're feeling caring for aging parents or for sick kids. What we're finding is those hills change dramatically, whether or not we think we're alone overcoming this challenge or we're with other people um, overcoming it. So I actually just got to go out um, earlier this year to speak at Camp Pendleton to, um, uh, to six battalions of Marines I was out there with a guy named Colonel Rideout, who's amazing and uh, such a great name uh, for what he does. And and uh, I took my son out there. He took him on amphibious vehicles, and it was amazing. And while I was out there, um, I got the question. You know, one of the Marines raised his hand and said, you know, our job is threat detection. Um, so do you want us to just be optimistic and just ignore all these threats that we see within our world? And, uh, you know, no, this comes right back to what we were just talking about, the rational optimism, this idea that we need to realistically assess the present, see all those problems, but believe we can overcome them. And one of the very first things that uh, the Marines do in, in basic training is it doesn't matter if you can get over the wall. What we care about is that the entire unit gets over the wall, right? So they break down this idea of right. it's all about self-help. You. Yeah, to this idea that is about the ecosystem of potential around us. So how do we find a way of being able to um, make it so that we could actually um, be connected as we pursued happiness and success instead of trying to do it alone? So, you know, the more I've done this work, I've come in contact with people who 
know, I've worked with uh, people who have um, stage four cancer. I've, I've worked with people. That I've worked with the National MS Society. I've, I've, you know, worked with you know students that you know at, in a shanty town in South um, South Africa um, that had dirt floors. Like I've I've met these people whose challenges in life uh, externally are so much higher than my own right. currently. Um, but I find that there's a direct connection. Like I, I feel that there's so much that um, that that links us together as we overcome these challenges. Because it turns out that I think a lot of people have gone through these dark times and depression, and it looks different for a lot of people. But we're finding that it could have um, that optimism, gratitude, and social connection work universally to help people to, to get out of it. So, Sean, with with the headlines. And knowing the statistics that about half of us feel isolated and many of us deal with anxiety, many of us are struggling with depression, and many of us actually believe that the best days are behind us, not in front of us. Like this is just not only for me and our listeners, but everybody else out there today who is not listening to our voice in our conversation. What is a couple things we can do every day to begin pushing through that darkness and coming back into the light? Um, I think there's... Two, two habits that we've been looking at and researching that seem to have a huge impact upon people. Um, so one thing we haven't quite covered yet is the idea that maybe we can't change. I think some people think you're genetically positive, right? Like that's how you've been so incredible in your career and overcoming challenges and the, the things that you face within your life. And of course, it must be easy for you, And right? And I get the same critique leveled at me as well. Um, I actually have genes um, for... Um, uh, I think I've, well, I know I have genes for family history of depression, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm having to fight against genes to do this. So what we're looking at is can people change anyway, right? So as people right. are feeling all those feelings you're ta- you're describing, on there's a camp of researchers who think, or and there's a lot of the world that thinks you just can't change, right? Sorry, that's your genes and you just didn't win the genetic lottery. Um, that's not what we found in our research at all. I mean, I'm working with all the schools in Flint, Michigan, in the middle of cyclical poverty. Like, I'm working with these, you know, hospitals doing life or death decisions, and working with um, cancer patients and you know people with MS. Like all these, all these people with high levels of unemployed groups. Um, uh, what we're finding is that um, we can take somebody who it seems genetically predisposed towards pessimism and getting them to do a few small tweaks to their day. Um, we can actually get them to dramatically change. So. One of those is as people feel like the best is behind them um, or they find themselves you know, seeing a threat on Twitter and then they just go down a rabbit's hole of all mm-hmm. the negative threats that can occur within their life. Um, that's our genes. As humans, you know, well, actually, let me tell you real quick. Um, I met up with the former U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Vivek Murthy, who I thought was amazing. And we were talking about this problem about people think they can't change. And he was like, it's so fascinating because if, you know, everyone listening to this has genes for teeth that should rot out by age 15 in a high sugar society, right? Like that's what it is to be human if what we are is genetic. So what it is to be human is just to have rotted out teeth. Unless you magically get an entire group of people to buy a toothbrush and toothpaste and every single day do this 45 second habit. But if you do so, right, if you do so, what it is to be human changes. And I believe the same thing is true with happiness. I believe that the majority of us have genes that predispose us to scanning for threats and we'll find more and more threats within our life. As we age, we'll feel like that the best is behind us and that there's only deterioration ahead of us. That's our genes. Um, and we can think that's what it is to be human. But what we've been finding is if you get somebody to do a two-minute positive habit, like brushing their teeth, yeah. but mentally – we find that what it is to be human changes. So real quickly, those two that we've been studying the most. One is we got people to scan each day, to practice scanning for three new things that they were grateful for that had occurred over the past 24 hours. So in the midst of seeing all the new news about what's going on negatively in terms of you know, pro- drops in oil and you know companies doing terribly and countries having to shutter their borders and, and coronavirus, in the midst of that, uh, that realistic assessment of the present, you also have your brain practice scanning for three things that you're grateful for in the midst of that. So one, it teaches your brain that there are still pockets of your life that are still positive. Right. But more importantly than that, your brain, as you do this, 
I had in the past, I used to tell people, think of three things you're grateful for. And that actually doesn't work because around day three or four, everyone starts repeating. Right. They're grateful for the Wife, work, their family. kids, help. bed. Yeah. No. Exactly, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you're grateful for. What matters is the scanning. So we got people to scan for three new things that they're grateful for. When you do that, your brain actually starts to build essentially a background app that passively scans your day for things you're going to mention the next day that you're grateful for. So without having to do anything different in your life, just creating a habit of this, your brain starts to pick up on these pinpricks of positivity that are going on over the course of the day. Sean, for me, you know, my my father's wrath and my mother's dirty look was probably why I started brushing my teeth at age three or whatever <laughs> age it was. And probably wanting to lay closer to my wife is why I brush it today as an older guy. How do we build in a habit, not just around brushing our teeth? I think most of us have that one figured out, but around choosing gratitude because I, you and I have a, the same heart around this and then getting people to not only hear it on a podcast or read it in a book, but actually to do it at night or in the morning, man, that's hard. And to do it as a ritual where it becomes a habit and begins to inform their life afterwards. How do we begin to do that? So uh, maybe people have to take it the easiest way possible. Like if you're already brushing your teeth, which I'm assuming everyone is listening to this, then while you brush your teeth, take that time to think of the three new things you're grateful for that have occurred over the past 24 hours. People who do this, we find that they can go from genetic low-level pessimist to low-level optimist in 21 days. Six months later, their testing is low to moderate level of optimist. Hmm. Four-year-old children around a dinner table who do this, at the dinner table as you sit, sit down with your kids, if you have them think of three new things that they're grateful for and you participate as well, it turns out uh, six months later, before and after school, those kids that were predisposed towards negativity, they were already testing as pessimists. They're now testing as low-level optimist, which is life-changing, so much better than that's my pessimistic kid, that's my optimistic kid. Um, another great way we've seen of people taking gratitude and making a ritual out of it is I met up with a... Uh, I met a grandmother in Flint um, as we've been working with all the schools. And she said she would have all of her kids sit down at a table and uh, or grandkids when they would come over to her house. She would sit them down and she'd listen for anything good that was going on in their lives, anything. And she'd write it down on scrap sheets of paper, crumple it up and put it into this little fish bowl or this glass jar. And then when her grandkids would come back over, she would sit them down again and then she would read out all these blessings that were going on in their life. And I heard that and I was like, wow, we have so much to be grateful for. My wife and I, um, we've got to be doing this, right? So we started doing it. Both times we've done it, 80% of the things we wrote down, uh, we've forgotten about. Mm. 80% of the blessings in our life, we would have lost access to. But I could tell you right now, every fire I need to put out in my inbox right now, I know all those negatives and threats are going on in my inbox, but my brain would have lost access to the blessings had we not created this ritual around it. And now we keep our favorite gratitudes in this bowl and it's in a visual place. So it's a constant reminder in the kitchen of not only how much good has been going on, but also that we need to do it for that day. And we go back and read our favorite ones out of there because we leave our favorite ones in. That's so good. I mean, you know, when I, when I hear a podcast, I'm always looking for one takeaway. And so listeners right now, if you're looking for yours, I, I think you may have just heard it, whether it's while you're brushing your teeth while you're gathered around the family. And, and Sean, I'm going to take the challenge. I Like you, I'm a speaker and author and a podcast host. And many of my events looking forward have at least paused, if not canceled. So I'm home now every night for dinner. And I can be mad that I'm not doing my job or remarkably grateful to be with my kids when otherwise right. I would not have been. So tonight and then going forward while I'm with these little ones, we're going to take the Sean Acre Gratitude Challenge Write down something we're grateful for, throw it in the little can in the middle of the table, and uh, and then celebrate dinner and life together. I love it. I love it too, man. Thank you for the the tip. I, I'm, I'm curious, though, as you, you gather around your table, you had some moments while you were raising your little one that it, this may not happen. Your little girl came 50 days early or two months early and then spent 50 days in NICU. Just out of curiosity, how, how did that time with your child – hanging on for life and wondering if she would be there the following day. How did that change you as a man going forward? Um, it changed a lot of things. Uh, so, uh, yes, my daughter was born two and a half months early. Um, she was actually born the same week that that book I mentioned earlier yeah. came out. So I spent years working on this book. Um, we wanted to come out. You go on a tour, as you know, a two or three week long book tour and then hoping and get some traction and then you get off the road for a little bit if you want to. So, 
um, instead of going on a book tour about how much of our happiness and success is interconnected with others, instead, for the next 50 days, my happiness, my daughter sat in an incubator in NICU being cared for by these angels that kept her alive in a way that my success rate would have been zero, um, keeping her alive. So what we got to do was see this research come to life, like how much of my happiness and success was reliant upon an entire community and not just the people at the hospital, but my wife and my son, uh, who was uh, four at the time, and our grandparents and our neighbors all banded together in the midst of this. So we are we didn't have a name for her at the time. We almost lost her three times. Um, and her name is Zoe Sparks Acor, and she just celebrated her second birthday because she kept sparking back to life, which is why we named her that. But at the same time, um, not only did we get to see this research in, in and uh, come alive, but also um, it was the best bonding that I've had with my son. My son's and my relationship changed dramatically. So I loved hearing your story about like how life has changed for you and I, like for many of the people that are listening, our life has changed because of outside external forces or economic forces. And absolutely, realistically, there's negative parts about that, like a loss of income or a loss of identity or loss of being able to help other people um, but there are also positives in the midst of it. Like I heard a, I gave a talk at a, uh, a breast cancer support group and um, I heard one of the women speak before me and she said, I wish I didn't have cancer. I hate cancer. But because of this cancer, I have the deepest social connection um, I've ever had in my life. I've never had female friends before. Mm-hmm. So what's amazing about this is she accurately assessed the cancer is, is terrible and traumatic. At the same time, there are also these incredible benefits. So one of the benefits for me was I spent so much time with my son that's completely transformed our relationship that I think will be transformed for the next you know 60 years going on because of this 50-day period of time. Tell Zoe Sparks that Uncle John is proud of her for sparking back to life. What, what a cool story. <laughs> and you know, when I was born as a nine-year-old, I assumed it happened to me and only me. Life is an island. As I've aged, I've realized what happened to me absolutely happened to my mom and dad Mm -hmm. and then dramatically happened to my five siblings. And when something happens, it can either push you all apart or it can actually draw you together. And in your situation, unfortunately, in ours, our family remains incredibly bonded because of this tragedy that is now a a triumph. I'm I'm going to give you uh, one of your quotes back and then ask you seven questions that we ask every one of our guests, Sean Akers. So one of my favorite quotes from you, I I wrote down two dozen. We don't have time for two dozen, so I'll pick one. Happiness is not the belief that we don't need to change. It is the realization instead that we can. Tell me what that means. I I feel like so often we think, you know, I'll be happy when I'm rich or powerful or beautiful or get into the school or have these types of friends. And I meet some of those celebrities or rich folks and they, the happiness didn't happen for them. They actually feel more jaded because it didn't occur for them. Um, but I feel like that the thing that causes the least amount of happiness for us is the perceived loss of growth. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, I get people asking me, there's, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, you start at basic needs all the way up to self-actualization where you like are finding really who you are as a person. You're able to be that person. Um, and people ask me where happiness fits into that. And um, I don't. I think you can have happiness at any point of that as long as you feel like you're moving up upward, right? right? right. Um, and I. so that's, that's to me where happiness comes from. Um, happiness to me isn't something that's complacent that causes us to rest our laurels. To me, happiness is a fuel that says, wow, this happened. I feel so grateful for it. What am I going to do next? So my definition of happiness that I've been using in this research is the joy you feel moving you towards your potential. So it's this emotion you feel in this direction, this directionality towards greater levels of growth. And that growth isn't just you know, having a nest egg or mm-hmm. a job. or That growth is being the type of dad or friend or um, member of society that you you could be. Sean Aker, author, teacher, student, friend, dad, and a whole, a whole lot of other job titles. Uh, seven questions for you now, my friend. Question number one is, what is the best book besides In Awe, which you <laughs> gave a beautiful testimonial to, what is the best book you have ever read? 
Um, my favorite book is uh, The Great Divorce, which is a very short book by uh, C.S. Lewis. And um, in short, he is about a group of people that live in this gray town, which you come to start to think might be like a hell. Mm. And they can get on a bus and go up to heaven. And all they have to do, choose is get on a bus <laughs> to go up to heaven. And you see all the things that stop somebody from choosing greater levels of joy in their life. And you watch it and you, I realize I'm all those people getting off the bus or getting out of line or choosing to get back, go back to the gray town. So um, I love the book because I thought it was a brilliant synopsis of what positive psychology actually was in the future. That's so awesome. And so many folks think heaven is where you might go when you die and they forget that, although that may be true, uh, you don't necessarily need to wait till you're dead to begin moving uh, on the bus toward it. So uh, that's right. What a cool book. I, I read that years ago, but it's been a while. What, what is one positive characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a little boy growing up in Waco, Texas, that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Um, I was really confident um, and not in like a cocky way, but like I would have no problem you know, talking to anyone. Like I, I, I thought I wasn't worried about what people would think about me. So I would just act. And sometimes I think that I, you know, I, I've finished conversations or podcasts or talks and I wonder, did that really matter? Did mm -hmm. I really have an impact upon somebody's life? You know, why am I doing this? And I, so like, I, I'll get people after talks like you do that will come up and they'll be like, I, I know you hear this all the time, but that was great. Um, and yes, I hear it all the time, but I kind of need to hear it all the time because I I keep forgetting that the, how much this matters, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed by all the other things. You know, like it's 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 easy to feel like you're just yeah. a, a small influence, and you realize that maybe somebody really need to hear that message that day. So, um, really quick, one thing I didn't say so far that I think is really important is the gratitude exercise is really good, but doing it externally is even more powerful. If you can just spend two minutes a day writing a two-minute positive email, praising or thanking somebody else, showing gratitude to somebody else, we found that not only does that dramatically improve your levels of happiness, which is amazing using technology to do that, but that positive email creates a ripple effect and a reciprocal loop where you actually start believing that you have deeper social connection and it knits that community together, even if you were starting out in a socially isolated place. So those small little things start to make you feel like the relationship you have really do have meaning. So it's about the small things that really, that really do matter. Well said. I'm glad you added it. Sean, if your home caught fire and your little ones and your wife are out safely, you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item. What's the one thing you would grab? I don't know. I've, we've talked about that as a family. I don't, I don't think I have anything. I'm going to make um, you grab one thing. Uh, I, I have a guitar that I love. <laughs> um, it's a broken guitar, but I love how it sounds. And uh, I don't think I could replace it even though, because I've had it for so long. That's awesome. The guitar is coming out. Sean, if you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anybody living or dead, who would you want to be seated right next to? Mm, uh, I, C.S. Lewis, he's been the biggest influence on in my life. Um, he's who I've modeled my career after. And um, I would really like to find out what he was like in person, not just in writing. What's your first question for C.S.? Um, uh, wow, that's a great question. I, I think uh, I, I'd want to know, uh, I'd want to know what he thinks about me, honestly. <laughs> I'd like to know like, I'd like to tell him about what I've been doing and what I believe, and I'd like to hear if, like, he approves or not. <laughs> like, awesome. if, he, if he, like, like agrees with me or he thinks I've completely gone the wrong direction so, or I'm missing something really vital. Uh, I look forward to you having that conversation, hopefully not for a long time, but uh, I have a feeling <laughs> it's going to be full of, uh, full of encouragement. Sean, what, what's the best advice you've ever received? Um, uh my mentor, Dr. Tal Ben Shahar from Harvard, yeah. um, said that uh, you're never as great as you think you are, and you're never as bad as you think you are. And at mm -hmm. first, I didn't like that quote at all because I'm like, well, you should always think good things about yourself. But now that I see it all the time, like I swing. Sometimes I think I'm amazing, and I realize how much I don't understand the world or other people, or I'm focused on myself. And other times, I'm like, what I do doesn't matter. And then, then you get these amazing emails from people who they heard something right when they needed to. Mm. 
what would you tell your 20 year old self, this college sophomore hanging out at Harvard? Um, make friends. I feel like I kind of wanted friends so badly and I just waited for them. Um, but I really do believe my grandmother was right. She said, if you want friends, you got to be a friend. And I would have, I would have given him 20 year old Sean some understanding that everyone feels lonely and insecure. Right. So, um, it, if you feel that, don't let that stop you from feeling socially connected. Like like other people's posts online, talk to them, give them praise. Tell your teaching fellow you want to meet up with them. Tell your teacher how much of an impact they've had upon you. Like these people that we put on pedestals, like even our friends, they they actually really need us. And there's very small things we could do that could make us a much better friend. And Sean Aker, the final question is, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Oh, there's so much. I, I don't know. I, I, that's a really tough question I've never been asked before. I, I wanted something along the lines of that, like, he made other people feel understood um, that uh, happiness was actually possible for them. Um, I, what I say in the end of my talks is that, yes, I believe happiness um, can change. I think happiness is contagious. I think happiness is an advantage in your life. But really, I think the greatest message in this is that change is radically possible. I mean, I remember being that kid lying on a bathroom floor at Harvard, so depressed, breathing hurt. Mm. I had no idea the story could change so much, um, like your story's changed. Um, so much that someday I would, you know, be studying happiness, much less that I would think it's possible for people, much less that I get to come on a podcast with you to get to share this with people who might be needing to hear it today. And so um, from that kid, thank you so much for having me on, mm -hmm. but also look how much, look how much the story can change. So I think that's what I want people to know is that my life was helping people realize change is possible. My friends, that is Sean Aker reminding us that your life can in fact change, that there is indeed an advantage in choosing happiness, that you have unlimitless big potential in your life. And in spite of some headwinds and headlines, that your best remains in front of you. Sean Aker, I want to thank you for your work, for your ministry, and for your impact. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your friendship and letting me be beyond, beyond your show. Honored. My friends, that is Sean Aker. I am John O'Leary. Today is your day. Live inspired. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Sean Aker. It is such an honor to discuss navigating coronavirus with him. And you know what? We should probably keep this conversation going. That's what I think we should do. During this season in which we are all experiencing incredibly high levels of worry due to the real and due to the perceived threats that coronavirus poses, there has never been a better time to be part of our Live Inspired community. So my friends, I want you to be reminded that you are an important part of the Live Inspired community. And as such, I hope you'll join us in taking the 21 Day In Awe Challenge to spark inspiration, meaning, and joy amidst the coronavirus outbreak. Each day, I'll share one short inspirational story and invite you to take one simple challenge. It's an action to refuse giving in to the headlines of the day and the headwind of the challenges and to infuse hope as you connect with other inspired friends. I don't know about you, but I myself am dealing with a lot of anxiety with these headlines, with these changes in the market, with offices and schools shutting down, with the outbreak seemingly looming on the horizon. And yet I also am seeking the truth that the best days are in front of us. My friends, this 21-day challenge is for not only me, but for you and for all of those seeking a truthful, honest perspective on where we are, where we've been, and what is possible together. I want you to take the challenge with me right now. It's kicking off today. Join me at Read in Awe. Dot com. Let me say it again, because I want to see you there. I want to make sure we are doing these 21 days of hope together. Take the challenge. Join me at readinawe.com. My friends, together, we will ensure that the best indeed is yet to come.